All right. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us today on uh, the, the July DevCast. Uh, my name is Jim Crispino. I'm the Senior Director of Developer Evangelism here at Genesis. And today I have with me again, John Carnell. He should be familiar to most of you by now. Um, he will be talking about managing your customer experience as code by introducing our new product called CX as code. Um, John is the architect and team lead of our developer engagement team, which uh, manages our developer center for G Genesis Cloud. So uh, a few logistics before we get started. Uh, we will attempt our best to have a 10 minute Q&A at the end of this tutorial. That depends on how long John talks. And um, this tutorial is being recorded. We will upload it to our community YouTube channel. You can find those videos at our developer center. Not at developer. Uh, the, the URL is wrong. You can probably still get there through developer.mypurecloud.com, but the real URL is developer.genesis.cloud slash video. And additionally, John is an author. He has a book um, that he has written and is going to be giving away five copies, I think, at the end of uh, this webinar. So I will be putting your names into the hat and I will draw five randomly during this webinar and John will let you know who won at the end. So with that, John, I will stop sharing and I will turn it over to you. Great. Uh, thanks, Jim. And I'm going to make a slight correction. I actually didn't write the book that we're giving away at the end. It is a uh, from my publisher, Terraform in Action. Uh, my publisher is Manning Press, and so they graciously donate it. Uh, a few copies of the Terraform in Action book when we start it. So let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. Can everybody see my screen? All right. Looks good, John. All right. Fantastic. So as Jim stated today, uh, you're going to see a little bit of a, a pinkish tinge to me right now because this is a very bright orange screen that you're seeing. But today what we're going to do is we're going to be talking about managing your customer experience as code or as what we like to call a CX as code. This talk is going to be geared for, uh, this is very much geared towards developers who are involved heavily in the DevOps uh, side of setting up and managing their code and their cloud infrastructure. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk through and show you how we can use one of our newest tools, CX as code, to be able to set up and externalize your um, Genesis cloud infrastructure, your queues, your call flows, all that stuff, and be able to integrate it into a CI CD pipeline. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started a little bit about myself. Uh, for those of you who have not been to one of my talks before, my name is John Carnell. Uh, I've been doing software development for, it seems like way too long, 26 years now, but I've been with Genesis for about six years with five of those years working on a tier zero development team. And then the last, uh, year working on our Genesis Cloud developer engagement team. So I'm super excited to be here working with developers. Developers are my passion. Developer tools are my passion. And uh, very, very excited to be uh, presenting today. So here's our agenda. And we're really going to be going uh, across two major bullet points. Is One, what is the problems with GUIs? Um, if anybody's worked long enough in this industry or has had to do any kind of serious platform administration, or deployment, uh, you run into very quickly the limitations with graphical user interfaces or GUIs. And that's really where uh, we're gonna use that as our launching point in the context of Genesis Cloud. And then we're gonna talk about how CX's code uh, can help you. What is it and how can it be applied? And specifically, we're gonna give a couple of real quick demos after we walk through the slides of actually showing CX's code in action. And then I'm going to leave you with a couple of closing thoughts. So let's start with the problem with GUIs. I want to start with what a typical scenario might be working within the Genesis Cloud platform. And that's of a developer having to build out an, uh, an email flow, an architect. And we'll take a uh, fictitious, fictitious uh, financial services company. This developer has been asked to build an email architect flow that's going to look at an incoming email uh, we, it's, they want to classify that email using a machine learning, learning algorithm. In this case, uh, they're going to use AWS uh, with Amazon Comprehend and a Lambda function. 
And so as that email comes into the Genesis Cloud organization and gets classified based on that classification, they want to go out and be able to route that to a number of queues. So let's say the email is on um, is on uh, an IRA or 401k. Um, it would be able to uh, be routed to the appropriate queue and to the appropriate agent. Now, to deliver this kind of solution, particularly in a larger environment, often means replicating this exact picture over and over and over in dev and test and making sure that all those pieces, whether it's your architect flow, your individual queue definitions, um, your calls out all have to be pointing and set up in order for that flow to work so that as it goes through dev and test and production, it can be done and it needs to be consistent. That's probably one of the biggest things is the more environments you have, the more consistency becomes an issue. So if you look at the traditional deployment model, uh, we have Mike. Mike is our telephony engineer. Mike has been a reoccurring guest on our uh, devcast, but he's a telephony engineer working with Genesis Cloud. And in the past with uh, any really kind of uh, telephony platform in order to set up these flows, particularly if there were multiple communication channels, Mike would have to go out into a GUI style tool and he would have to set up each of these different flows um, and in this case, we're working just with an email flow and you have to do it by hand, right? Because there wasn't a good way to easily promote those flows and all of their corresponding dependencies from one environment to the next. And as anybody who's done any kind of system administration, it's easy to make mistakes. It's easy to forget things because configuration drift is the enemy. Configuration drift is when you have differences between your different environments. You started out something nice in dev, you promoted it to test and you think you've got everything. And then somebody went in and changed something and they forgot to include that or document that. And when it got promoted to production, it was missed. And guess what? That caused an outage. So this is kind of the traditional deployment model that Mike has been working in. Now, when Mike could go out and script this, he could write this uh, using like a scripting language and have, uh, use our APIs to promote that. But the problem is there's a lot of components involved in that flow that you just saw, right? There's the routing component components with the 401k, 529 queues, the general support queue. There's integrations that have to be put in place, uh, calling out to Amazon. So we need uh, a Genesis Cloud integration and a data action configured to point out. And then there's the management of the flows and the email domain and route. So Mike has to build all this himself and he has to maintain what the state of the environment is and make sure that he understands it. And more importantly, he has to make sure he understand the, understands the order in which things need to be created. So in order for a flow to be successfully deployed, he has to make sure that the routing queues are already out there, that the integration components are out there. And then after the flow is deployed, he has to set up an email domain and an email route. And he needs to make sure that all gets in order and that you know, if he's using the APIs, he's got to go and look up everything by logical or by GUIDs, not by logical names. So it becomes a real nightmare and a real amount of work to have to figure all of these pieces out. Now, we have a lot of tools that we can use and the CXS code is on the end here. I'm not going to go through in all the, the gory detail, but we've got our API and our SDK and that's kind of the lowest level tool uh, that you can use. It gives you the most fine grained control, but it completely exposes the programming model and you have to have a, a great deal of scripting and development work involved in it. We have a command line interface and the command line interface can be used, our CLI can be used in like kind of DevOps pipelines, but it's really geared more towards administrative work. Uh, you know, when an, admin, uh, an administrator has to do some kind of ad hoc work, move a lot of users, between queues, so on and so forth. And then we have our Archie tool, which is really just focused on flow management. How do I get flows from one environment to the other? It doesn't really care about any of the other dependencies those flows might, uh, might have to be on. Our newest tool is called CXS Code, and it is really kind of a DevOps style configuration management tool that is geared towards having you declare your infrastructure objects your queues, your trunks, your, uh, your integrations, all in plain text files that people can read that can be checked into a source control system and then promote it from environment to environment. 
The goal is to start building out towards an immutable architecture where changes in your core telephony infrastructure are done in a development or sandbox environment and then promote it between environments without human interaction. The cool thing about CX's code is it's declarative and it's very powerful. It's got a lot of templating capabilities and a lot of kind of almost programming language capabilities with for loops and conditional logic and all stuff like that. So when we talk about how CX's code fits into this and where ideally we'd like Mike to get is we want to be able to envision that Mike is working and doing all of his development with his call flows and configuration and setup and kind of a sandbox environment, right? He's working in a, 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 a single dev environment or even a shared dev environment, but he's doing everything declaratively. He's figuring everything out first, then builds a declarative model and checks it into source control where then it can go through a series of quality checks. It can get promoted to the development environment and then get promoted to tests and then production and so on and so forth. Mike, after he's done the initial development and the additional kind of declaration work of all these components is no longer involved in the development or in the deployment process. Instead, the architecture becomes immutable. You're, the idea is, is you don't want a human being involved in the process because we're uh, fallible th creatures, right? We make mistakes, we forget things. Machines are very, very good at just doing exactly what they're told and doing it between environments. So what exactly is CX's code? Uh, well, at a 50,000 foot view, CX's code is really built around the concept of infrastructure as code for Genesis Cloud. Now, if any of you guys have worked in a DevOps style environment, uh, the idea is, is that you're declaring your infrastructure. You're not actually setting it up. You're not some, having somebody go out there by hand. And you know, if I had to draw an analogy to uh, a system administrator, going out and configuring the operating system by hand. Instead, you're declaring how you, how you would like it to look and having it provisioned without actually knowing how it's happening. Now, CX's code is built on a technology called Terraform, which comes from uh, HashiCorp. And HashiCorp's Terraform product is an open source project. It's meant to be built as a plugin, hence why CX's code sits on top of Terraform. And it's really meant to allow you to do kind of this uh, declarative resource declaration across multiple cloud providers. A lot of CX uh, Terraform originated in being able to provision things like AWS or Azure or Google Cloud. But what we've done is we've taken that and we've built an open source Terraform plugin. So you can actually go and look at the code, make your own modifications. That sits right on top of Terraform. It's completely written in Golang and it exposes Genesis Cloud resources and basically calls our public API underneath the covers to actually carry out the work. So the first thing when we talk about Terraform and CX's code is we got to work through some terms because I'm going to be throwing a lot of terms out here during this discussion. And it's good to kind of know where we're starting. So first of all, the most important term is provider. Terraform's framework has a different cloud, uh, cloud vendors, either through open source or through their own uh, plugins. Uh, donate uh, or build what's called providers. So we are, CX's code is a Terraform provider. It controls all the resources and defines all the resources and the data actions that you're going to be able to use. A resource is an individual object that can be created, updated, or deleted. A resource is something you would think of as like infrastructure. I'm gonna define a queue and I'm gonna define all the attributes associated with that queue. And then that's what Terraform and CX's code is going to use to go create that queue in my Genesis cloud environment. It's got data sources. A data source provides the ability to look up things like GUIDs so that you can use, if you already have an existing resource in your environment, you can reference it in a Terraform project. Terraform allows you to use variables. So as I walk through this project, you're gonna see several parts where I've parameterized my Terraform flows and my Terraform files so that they can accept input values and can also produce output values that you can use to basically then make your flows configurable. Because as any of you guys have worked when you're working between a dev and a test and a production environment, there's gonna be differences in configuration. So the variables play a key role in how you set this up. You're gonna hear me talk about modules. Modules are 
chunks of code that you've written in Terraform or declared in Terraform, I shouldn't use the word code, uh, but it's blocks of declarative code that you can pass into and uh, pass variables into, and that you can also use across environments. Think of it like as a way of writing the equivalent of a function in Terracode. You might hear me use the word HCL or HashiCorp language. HCL is a markup language that we use to declare all of our Terraform objects in. So if you hear me use HCL, think of it as like a, a markup language akin to YAML. <laughs> and then backing state. This is how Terraform goes out and manages state when you're deploying things out to Terraform. And Terraform has to go, oh, is this, our, is this uh, state changed? Are we going to create something? Are we going to update it? Or are we going to delete it? That backing state contains that information. So here's an example of a resource definition that you'll see uh, in our code examples. I'm going to walk through these pretty quickly. I'm using the example of being able to define a queue, a Genesis Cloud queue. So this is written in the HashiCorp language. And from our definition that you can see out here, we have, uh, first of all, the resource ID. Uh, what kind of resource is this? It's a Genesis called routing queue. We give it a logical name because the logical name is what we're going to be able to use later on. Uh, we are giving it attributes. And we are passing in uh, variables or references to variables in here. So this is an example of where we have a division that we've looked up previously, and we want to reference the ID. Now, you'll notice here that we're also using one of our Genesis Cloud GUIDs in here. This usually means that this was either hard-coded in because it wasn't going to change. We're only working in one environment. Or we don't have a data source out there. Uh, not to worry. If we don't have a data source that exposes that uh, particular ID, it's very, very simple to use tools like our CLI to look, at, look it up. But then it's really just about going out and defining all of the attributes associated with the queue ahead of time. So you can see our media setting alerts. You can see uh, who could be a member. You can define them who the members of a queue are. And you can also say, here are all the wrap-up codes associated with that queue. I show this as an example because I'm not going to walk in depth on each one of these objects, but it should give you a general feel for how when you're using CX's code, you're declaring that piece of infrastructure and so therefore it will be the same as you promote it from dev to test to production. All right, so let's go ahead and keep going. Uh, this is an example of just some of the uh, resources that we are actually supporting. These are ones that are out there right now. I'm not gonna go through every one of them. And this is what we're planning on and we're still building out now as we speak. Terraform is available, uh, our CXS code is available as open source. You can actually go out and download it. We have instructions on our site but it is still in a beta. So not all of our resource and objects are built out yet. So this is an example of a data source. So let's say you have out there already an existing user that you want to associate with a queue. So you might have some of your objects that are managed by Terraform and some of, or some of them that have just been created by hand. Maybe you have an existing org and you wanna look at how you can use CX's code in Terraform. A data source provides you a way of looking up a GUID associated with a particular object, in this case, a user, and then lets you reference that later on in the code. So whenever you hear the word data source, always think of it, it's a way of looking up an ID based on a logical name. We don't have data sources defined on every one of our Genesis Cloud objects, but we're building out an entire portfolio of them as we go. This is an example of a module, a very, very basic one. I'm going to give you a much more sophisticated one. But the idea is, is that you can go out and you can define modules and you can pass in variables that can be set via environment variables, can be set in a file so that when you run your Terraform flow, it will actually go out and inject those values in there. So the thing to think about modules is they're like reusable chunks of code that you can use not only between environments, but you can even set up your modules to be reused within your flows. Down here are some examples of where we've set up a variable. We've set up, we've got a resource in one of our uh, modules set up within one of our, re our resource set up in one of our modules. And we're passing in a value um, in our Terraform call that will actually then go and get set. Now, the really cool thing about modules, and I'll give you a better and more in-depth examples, is one, they really let you break apart 
your Terraform definitions, your CX's code definitions with all of its pieces into very small manageable pieces. And then they can be set up to be reused um, across multiple flows. So if you have a standard definition that you want for queues and your Terraform flows that you want to reuse across all your deployments, you can just define them with a couple of variables that set for the things that you want different and just be able to reference them, all right? All right, so enough, enough talk, I wanna get into a demo. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go out and I am going to go through that email flow that I just showed in my earlier picture. And I'm gonna show you the project first because there's a lot of little moving pieces of Terraform out here. So when we talk about our Terraform project, we're going to have environment variables that are gonna set up our credentials. Terraform, uh, our CX's code provider with Terraform uses an OAuth client credential to go out and connect to Genesis Cloud. Then for our variable configuration between environments, we're going to have a file out there containing our individualized parameters. In this example, we only have one parameter that really changes between environments, our email domain. Now an environment, we're gonna have two environments. We're gonna have a dev environment and a prod environment. We're gonna have a variables file that defines the variables that are gonna be associated with that environment. And then we're gonna have a main.tf. That's our main Terraform file that's going to basically reference all the modules we're going to use. And then also provide the mapping of the variables being passed in to those modules. Now our modules, remember, are chunks of reusable code. So we're gonna have a module on setting up our queues, a module we're gonna set up for data actions for our email routes and our email flow. And this one's gonna be a little special because we don't have Archie yet as a first class citizen or flows as a first class citizen within Terraform. So what I'm gonna show you is how to use Terraform and Python and Archie, a very little bit of Python to basically call out and build our flows from um, our CX's code Terraform example. And then finally, I'm just gonna create a user. So I'm gonna, when this is all said and done, we're gonna have a complete environment that's going to have all four of the queues set up, a user set up listening to that queue, and email flow, uh, the integrations and uh, domain uh, data action for the flow. And then we're going to also have um, the flow itself instantiate it with email domain and route. So I believe total that's 11 different objects that we're creating pretty much with almost all of them being done declaratively. It's only that last little Archie piece that I had to go out and uh, um, uh, write a little Python wrap around. And we'll get into that when we get into code. So let me go ahead. I'm gonna go ahead and change my screen share. And Jim, if you can just let me know if I end up on the right place, I should be bringing up a Visual Studio Code example. Oop, hold on. And desktop. There we go. Hold on, desktop three. There we go. And we're going to start walking through at a very high level. That's your Genesis Cloud. There's your, there's your Visual there Studio. There you go. I was getting there, Jim. All right. Okay. So, uh, basically at a very high level, starting with a CX's code slash Terraform project, is we're gonna have our individual environments that we're man managing. And then we're gonna have our modules with our definitions. Now, one thing to keep in mind is if you go out and read the Terraform documentation, you could put everything into a single file, right? But you're gonna very quickly find that even with a single, a very small stack of things that you're working with, that file can get very big. So this is why we've organized this. I've kind of taken this around Terraform best practices. So let's go ahead and just very quickly look at our modules because that's where the majority of the work's going in. So I have out here, I have a main module and underneath, oops, underneath each module, I have a definition. I have to provide uh, what Terraform provider and what CX code provider I'm gonna use. And then I'm gonna go out and I'm basically going to define a Genesis Cloud object, in this particular case, a user with all the attributes associated with that user. Now this particular setup is for demo only. I would not recommend that you do mass provisioning of users using CX as code. Uh, we have SEIM tools and so on and so forth for that. And I'll get into that at the end of the talk with some things on there. But you'll see that we've set up users we're going to define a queue, 
and this is where things really, really get interesting, is I have a generic definition of a Q, but if you look, I'm using this, this thing called a for each. And this is basically part of the HashiCorp language that basically lets me define an iteration where I can define, let's say in my environment, a list of queue names, and then I can walk through each one of those queue names and create a queue. So I'm basically, for my example, I'm gonna create four queues, but I only have one definition. And each of those queues are all gonna have this applied. Now, when I was very first learning Terraform, uh, I literally sat down and defined out every one of my queues. And I was like, this is kind of dumb. I, I like to follow the don't repeat yourself, uh, principle, the dry principle, and I'm finding myself with the same block of codes with anything more than name. But the power of things like CX the code running on Terraform is, is you get this very rich templating language that lets you start building out building blocks of things. Now, under each one of our modules, besides the main code definitions, I also define the variables that I'm going to pass in. So in this case, I'm passing in a list of queue names and a list of users, that, agents that should belong to that queue. And I do that over and over and over again. So for instance, on my data actions, here's my definition of a data action. I've created the integration that you would see out there. I've created my um, uh, mapping of my user, uh, of my body uh, coming in on the data action. And then I actually have the actual call out to a REST-based service since this is a REST-based data action. If you'll notice, I have a single two variables in there because I'm making a call out to AWS and I'm using the API gateway. I need to be able to pass in a URL and API key to my data action because it might be different between my dev, test, and production environment. Now, once I've got all these modules set up, the last really big one that we're going to walk through is, excuse me, is our email flow. Now, like I said, right now, Archie is not, and flows are not a first class citizen within CX's code. So that means they don't natively participate yet in CX's code and in the dependency graph that CX's code manages, which I'll get, get into in a moment. Um, so instead what I'm doing is I'm using in CX's code what's called a null resource, which is kind of like an escape hatch that says, you know what? I'm going to go out and I'm going to call a script. And I've written a script to go out and wrapper my Archie call. And then as my last step, create the email domain route that is going to be used to send emails to um, this flow. And the reason why I had to do this is because Archie isn't a first class citizen yet. We are working on integrating it into CX's code we have to manage all the dependencies downstream for Archie. So after we create a flow, we want to make sure that we also create the email domain route associated with that flow. So I'll walk through very quick, quickly the script on that. But it's nothing more than, I think I did 84 lines of Python, and I do a create and a delete. And if the core of it is doing my call out to Archie, passing in my YAML file, passing in my secret, my OAuth client and secret, and spitting out the results, and then creating the email route associated with that using uh, a Python uh, SDK call. So very, very, while it's, no it's still a little code yet, it's still way less than if you'd have to do this all with APIs. Now, for those of you who haven't worked with Archie yet, Archie represents all the flows that you put together in your nice graphical user interface as a YAML file. And you know, there's a lot of capabilities in Archie I'm not going to get into. There's you know, uh, substitution where you can parameterize it, all sorts of different things that you can do with it. But for this purposes, I've taken the flow that I built in the GUI, I've exported it as a YAML file, and I've got it set up. So now when I look at my dev environment, what I'm basically going out and doing is I'm again configuring uh, a backing state where I'm going to manage my state. Uh, in this case, it's on the local file system. And then I go through and I just pull in these modules that I want to use. So I say, okay, I want to use a users module, the classifier module. Here's the list of queues that I'm going to pass in as an env environment variable for my queues. So I want a 401k queue, an IRA queue of 529, so on and so forth. I've got routes and I'm good to go. And here is the file definition that is going to be different between each environment. So 
For now, I'm using the same URL for my dev and my prod environment for my AWS call. But you can see here, I've got for my email route, dev engage with its domain region of being pure cloud. But in my production route, which is the exact same code, except for my variables, have now dev engage prod. Very, very simplistic example, but I didn't want to throw too much. I'm sure there's uh, some of you guys are probably like, what have I gotten myself into? My eyes are glazing over. But you'll see in my prod definition, I'm using the exact same modules. And the cool thing about modules is I can have these checked into my own source control system and pulled down with my code. I can reference them on a GitHub repo so I can have a shared repo that people want to, that people can access. So modules are probably one of the shining stars when we talk about Terraform. So let's go ahead. I'm going to quick do a kind of a proof here that we don't have anything. I have one of my orgs out here. It's called Carnell One. And I'm going to go to admin and I'm going to go to email. And as you can see, there's no email domain or route. I'm going to go to architect. All right, and I'm gonna to go to my inbound email flow. And there we go, there's no route in there. And just, let's just check the last thing. I wanna make sure I don't have any queues. So I go out here and I have no queues that have been created. So I'm gonna show you guys how to run this from the command line, but really uh, this is meant to be integrated into a CI CD pipeline. So the idea is, is that I'm going to do all this development. I'm going to write these files. Yes, it seems like a lot of work. But then when I commit them to my source control system, my CI CD pipeline will pick them up and deploy them automatically to dev, or however your CI CD pipeline is, is uh, set up. So let's go out then and let's take a look at my development environment. I have a dev environment and a prod environment. So the first thing I'm going to do is I've got all my files out here. And I am going to do a Terraform um, apply, and I'm going to auto approve it. Because if I don't pass in auto approve, what's going to happen is Terraform is going to run. It's going to look at its backing file of how it manages all of that state for whatever is being managed under uh, Terraform. And it's going to go, oh, here's what's changed. All right, You've got, you're adding a queue, you're updating a queue, you're doing whatever. And then it's going to ask you if you want to go ahead and approve that change. So in this case, I'm going to go out and I'm going to um, just say auto approve so we can see this all run. And let's make this a little bit bigger. So as I've shown, I've got all my definitions out here. And I always do the deep breath in as this is a live demo. All right, so that's our plan that you're seeing here. This is everything that we're going to do with this particular run of Terraform. Now, since this is a completely uh, clean environment, we're uh, uh, creating everything from scratch. So one of the use cases that I've seen for Terraform right off the bat is to be able to very quickly provision and tear down um, entire stacks of functionality. So you might end up with multiple Terraform projects centered around each specific flow and each of its dependencies. And depending on your environment setup, you might have a lab where you're like, well, I want to try this. Let's provision this. Let's just run the Terraform script. We're going to do some demo. We're going to do some testing. We're going to do some training. Or the other use case that I've seen is CI CD pipelines with promotion of changes across environments. So now what we're seeing is we've seen everything go out and we actually within CX's code, print out the IDs of everything that's been created. So we created a user, we created queues, we created our data action, and more importantly, we also um, are creating everything in the right order. So we did all of these things before we go out and we call our Python script. So our Python script here is creating our Archie flow, and it's creating in the end, um, the, the, the last mile, the email domain route. So let's go ahead and flip back over to our console just to show that I am not fibbing here. 
And we should see now a peer engaged dev created, or hold on, I'm in my queues right now. So we see our four or five queues, all right? There's our four queues. All right. And then let's go to admin and look at email. And we've got a dev engage uh, peer cloud. And let's go ahead and refresh our architect flows. So I've completely recreated my architect flows and everything's been created in the right order because if you go out and look, I know this is probably a little bit hard to see. Let's just go edit this for a moment and then I'll cancel it. Is we have a data action right up front, right up here at the beginning. And if anybody who's worked with Archie or flows know that if you create a flow without the corresponding um, data action dependency there, this will show up as red and you won't be able to actually do anything with that flow until you resolve it. So let's go ahead and close that out. Okay, so we've created all of these objects and, and just, uh, I'm gonna be real, really daring here. I'm gonna go to my email. And go out in my email, now hold on a minute. I'm gonna grab a little text body here. I'm gonna copy it. Just one moment. I'm gonna to go to my email and I'm gonna to put together an email. In here. And I'm gonna say, I need help with my IRA. And I know this is a bit of a contrived example. I'm sure people have much more sophisticated uh, flows, but I'm gonna send this to support at peerengagedev at peer.cloud peer with it being developer engagement dev. That's a domain I set up. So I'm gonna go ahead and this is gonna take a few minutes to process, but this would actually put this in queue in the flow. And one of the steps I have in my flow is to automatically respond back then with uh, an indication from the Amazon Comprehend piece about you know, what it classified it as. So I'm gonna leave that there. We'll see if we actually get a response back. And then let's go ahead and continue on with the second part of our demo. So, all right, we've got this out here um, in our dev environment. And the second demo that I promised you guys was to actually show you then this running in prod. So that was our dev environment. And here is our prod environment. So in prod, I have pretty much the exact same flows being created. And I just hear the ding for my email. Um, I have my exact same flows created, but the only difference is, is I'm sending it to a prod email. This is a completely separate Genesis Cloud org. It's using a completely different OAuth token, completely segregated from anything else. So I want to recreate that exact same environment out there. So I'm just going to go ahead and run Terraform apply. And it's going to go ahead and apply. And while that's running, let's go take a look at our email. Ah, look at that. I need help with my IRA. My data action sent an auto reply with the answer from our AWS Comprehend classification. And then if I actually logged in as that agent I created, you would actually see that guy sitting on the queue and pop up as an interaction ready to be uh, picked up and processed. So while I am running my plan over here, I am going to log out of my environment in Carnell one. And I'm going to change my organization to Carnell two. And log in. To my environment and I'll just go ahead and show you the architect flow because everything should have worked really uh, well at this point. Yep, there we go, all of our resources, an exact duplicate of exactly what we defined in our file 
has now been created inside of another organization. So let's go out here. I'm going to go to architect. I'm going to go to email, inbound email. And there is our comprehend flow. All right, cool. So that's kind of the demo part of it. That's probably the end of the demo part. So I'm going to go ahead and flip back over to the PowerPoint. I'll wrap it up and then we'll have a few minutes for questions. All right. So closing thoughts. Um, when should you use CX's code? Uh, CX's code is really geared towards what I call application infrastructure management. I, you know, I tell people you got to look at a lot of times at the velocity of change of the infrastructure in your, in your environment. If you're trying to manage users, users could be changing on a really regular basis. You probably don't want to tie that to your CICD pipeline. But when you're talking about things that tend to want to be set and promoted without any human interaction because they're core pieces of your call center or your contact center infrastructure like flows and data actions and queues, CX code works great. And I always tell people that you should think about it as you're deploying a stack of functionality, right? Just like if you're an AWS developer, you deploy a CloudFormation stack with your web servers and all of your pieces, and then your code is also deployed on your web servers as part of that deployment. It's all deployed at once, deployed as a stack of functionality. And one thing I tell people is, um, we're not going to get into it here, but CX's code actually lets you segregate your environment a little bit, even within an environment, to have what's called workspaces. Um, CX's code can be combined with other cloud infrastructure deployments because it's all based on Terraform. Let's say you have to deploy a web service to Amazon that's critical to your call flow, that's part of that call flow. It can all be deployed as part of that single Terraform uh, CX's code environment, right? You're going to have your CX's code provider and you're going to have your Amazon provider. And then my last thing kind of ties back up avoid tasks where data and data mapping change on a regular basis. So um, here's what's coming up next. Uh, we've, we're actively working on flow integration with the architect team. We're kind of tentative on the August, September timeframe. You know, it's always a little bit of a, a target. Uh, we just finished getting phone integration. So you can actually provision WebRTC phones using CX's code. We're looking at building out a GitHub repo with examples and maybe some reusable modules. So anybody who's worked with our APIs knows, for instance, the phone API can be incredibly complex or setting up a trunk can be incredibly complex. We're looking at going out there and being able to have examples that you can just pull down and be able to use. Finally, we've got a couple of new blueprints in the works. So you guys saw one of them that's in content review right now. That's our email, um, not our email translation blueprint, our email comprehend blueprint, sorry, too many blueprints and not enough bullets. And then uh, an example of using CX's code with Git Actions. Finally, we're looking at adding a couple of new capabilities in our CLI that will help support taking existing orgs and setting them up for CX's code. Where can I find this information? Um, let me see real quick. I've got my webpage up here. We've got a number of different spots for finding out information on CX's code. Um, one is on the developer center underneath on the home page. We actually have right underneath here our CX's code, and it gives you an introduction to being able to set it up and what needs to be done to configure it. Uh, obviously, there's documentation from Terraform, but Terraform has a registry where we've registered our plugin, our CX's code plugin. That includes all of our documentation with guides and resources about everything. Uh, so here's all of the resources we currently support. More are coming. And here's all the data sources we currently support. And then finally, we do have a blueprint. It's not out on our blueprints page yet because it's still going through content review, but it is in our GitHub Genesis Cloud blueprints repo that pretty much has that project that you just saw with everything in it. So on that note, uh, two good resources I always like to recommend. Uh, there's two books that I use, Terraform Up and Running from O'Reilly Press, and then Terraform in Action from Manning. And that is a book that, uh, one of the five books that we're going to be giving away uh, in electronic form at the end of this talk. All right, so that is all I have. And I would be open to questions and chats then. 
All right, John, thanks for that. Um, we've got a couple of questions in the Q&A panel, I think that we're waiting on answers for, if you wanna take a look at those. Sure, sure. Uh, can I import and export entities from external data sources and augment with CX's code prior to a push to a target organization? Um, the, it really depends. I mean, I think I, I know where you're going from. Like you have to look up some values, uh, let's say from a database. There are provisioners, there are uh, data sources that let you do that against many of the common databases. Plus, as you saw with the null resource, you can go and you can um, uh, call out and do work with a Python script. I would recommend uh, based on what your, what your database provider or data sources, go look through the CXS code or the Terraform registry because there's already a boatload of plugins that help with that. But the answer is, uh, uh, a, a semi-firm, yes, you can do it. It just depends on uh, what's supported and what's not. And then the second question is, will Terraform be offered integrated into Genesis Cloud as the execution environment, maybe in time, or will customers be setting up their own environments? That's, that's a good question. I'll probably let Becky uh, Powell, our product manager, um, answer that. Uh, I always hate speaking for the direction of the product. Um, it gets me in trouble. <laughs> so Becky, if you want to hop on. Yeah, I can take this one. So the answer is almost never no to these kinds of questions. It's just a matter of when and how. So right now it's not a roadmap item for us, but that's not to say that it's not something we would want to support moving forward. So um, at this time, not a roadmap item, but potentially in the future. Can I, can I add to that too, is that um, Terraform has a product called Terraform Cloud that will host Terraform for you. So, you know, really, if you wanted a hosted solution, you could just use Terraform Cloud. We use that for some of our automation internally anyway. Um, and so it's, it's something that you could do on your own. Awesome, awesome. All right, uh, any other questions before we do the book giveaway? All right, well then let's go ahead. Uh, I've got, um, or uh, I've got five people. Uh, we've got Andy Sly, uh, Iger uh, Bozak, Jason Kurat, Stephen Dean, and Lee Swire. Uh, we've got, uh, we're the winners from the drawing. So we've got uh, five uh, copies of the Electronic Terraform in Action. I personally, I love that book. It, it really does a good job of going and doing a deep dive. So if you want to go ahead and send me an email at john, J-O-H-N dot carnell at genesis.com. And I've got my, that up on the slide right now. Um, go ahead and send that to me and I will send you the, um, the code you can use to enter at Manning's website. You go through and you purchase the book, but then you put the code in and it basically zeroes it out uh, for the dollar amount. Also, just as a closing thing, um, I would encourage people to also, if you've got questions about Terraform, post on the developer forum. Uh, I've included my email in here. I do try to answer people's questions. Um, and then, uh, you know, but the forum is always best because we can share uh, information out there and be able to also uh, browse what other people have gone through. And then I always include my LinkedIn uh, profile because honestly, people find me on LinkedIn. So I'm like, okay, why don't I just go ahead and include it on the slide set? So uh, thanks everybody. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and really excited about this and looking forward to uh, people adopting this and, and trying it out and getting your feedback. Thanks, Jim. All right, thanks a lot, John. Appreciate the time today. And we will look for you on the next DevCast. Watch out for the developer newsletter that announces that soon. All right, thanks everyone. Have a good day. Yep, Bye -bye. thank you.